So it's my great pleasure to introduce Tim Harcourt. Uh, Tim, Tim is known as the airport economist. He's a prolific author and globetrotter, and you'll see the globetrotting in his presentation. Recently been appointed the first J.W. Neville Fellow in Economics and University of New South Wales, Australian School of Business, following a distinguished career as Chief Economist at Austrade. An active commentator in the Australian and international media on economic issues, he appears regularly on TV, radio shows like Business Late Line, Sky Business, Business Today, Sunrise, Bloomberg, CCTV and CNBC Age. He also writes for a number of newspapers, magazines, websites and blogs. His best-selling book, The Airport Economist, can be found at all good bookstops, including airport bookshops, Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tim Harcourt. Well, good morning, Sydney. Good to be here. Um, I, I just came back from uh, Argentina. Um, as you know, uh, Argentina has a new pope. Uh, they're a little bit, um, they've got a bit of a rivalry with Brazil, and they're a bit annoyed that Brazil had five World Cups, and uh, Argentina only has two, and so now when it comes to popes, it's Argentina one, Brazil nil. So they're pretty happy about that. And the deal was, the deal was, if I went over to Buenos Aires and fixed up the pope for Argentina, the deal was with the new pope is that I have to make three confessions before I talk to you today. So um, the first confession is I'm an economist, so I'm going to show you lots of slides, lots of graphs. I'm a bit of a slide junkie. Ben Cousins, uh, the rugby league players, the rock stars, they're junkies too. They go to California for rehab. I do too, they dry me out, I come back, I've still got to show you a few economic graphs, but there'll be a few, few pictures as well, so, uh, so that'll, that'll keep you going. The second confession is, I have a very aristocratic surname, Harcourt, or Harcourt, sounds very British, very French. Um, I go to the OECD each year, and uh, they say, ah, Monsieur Harcourt, welcome, welcome back. There's a Chateau d'Harcourt in the north of France, uh, and I go there each week, each year for six weeks and say I'm a long lost relative and I, I sort of hang out at the chateau. Um, but the trouble is, and this is the second confession, it's all lies, I'm not Harcourt at all. Uh, my ancestry is actually Transylvanian, which uh, I suppose you think, Transylvania, Dracula, bloodsuckers, economists, it all sort of, <laughs> all sort of makes sense. So uh, my, uh, my grandfather, uh, he, his people came from Transylvania, which is now Romania, it's sometimes Romania, sometimes Hungary, the borders change. If I'm with Frank Lowy, I'm definitely uh, Hungarian. And um, uh, my grandfather, uh, he um, grew up in Bondi. His, um, he, his name was Kopel Harkovitz. His mother wanted him to be uh, a rabbi because she was very religious. He was an atheist, so he thought that wouldn't be the best occupation uh, to go into. But he also wanted to join the Bondi Surf Club and he could never get in as Harkovitz. They sort of said, look, we don't need any life-saving rabbis, Copel, thanks. And so he changed his name from Copel Harkovitz to Ken Harcourt. He went into the Bondi Surf Club the next week and they said, oh, Ken Harcourt, come in, we need more lifesavers. So he got into the club. And um, I always said, well, why did you change your name? Because Harkovitz would be a great name for a Nobel Prize winner in economics. Uh, there, was, there, was a, there was a Harry Markovitz who won the Nobel Prize for his uh, thesis on long-term uh, hedge funds, but it went broke later, but that's okay. You don't, don't have to give the money back with the Nobel Prize. Um, and I said, well, why did you change our name? It was a great name. And he said, I didn't change our name. I just uh, uh, left the Goldbergs so I could join the Icebergs. Uh, and, and that's why we're, we're Harcourt. And in fact, when the previous Pope came to Randwick for World Youth Day, some of you might remember, um, some of the people from that, that yeshiva, uh, the descendants of his classmates, actually got onto the pitch onto the field during the mass and they had to clear them all off and evacuate. But now Ramwick has fixed that problem. They now have a rabbi-proof fence, so, so that won't happen again. <laughs> now, I, um, I, as an economist, I confess that I don't quote a lot of economists, but I do quote um, rock stars and people in popular culture. So I want to quote John Lennon today, and he had the very famous uh, song and, and, and phrase, imagine, so I want you to Imagine for a moment a, a, a country that is inward looking, really looks at the world beyond its own shores. It has double digit inflation and very high unemployment. Um, it hides behind tariff walls, it has a fixed exchange rate, 
it wins the Olympic gold medal for strikes every year and it has few foreign students or few foreign tourists and you can't get a Thai or a Chinese meal anywhere. Well, you, you don't have to imagine uh, too hard because that country is Australia 30 years ago uh, before we changed our economic engagement with the world, with Asia, and we changed our own culture, almost as if we were an organisation opening up to the world. And I notice now, uh, as, uh, as a bit of an airport economist, travelling around the world with the university and, and, and uh, other representations, how different the world views Australia and how different Australia, um, Australia engages with the world. Now, Sean did mention, and this is in a way my fourth confession, that I'm a bit of an airport economist, so I think I've been to 58 economies in the last five years. So it means you go to every economy in the world for three days and uh, you only see the airport and the hotel, but somehow you've got to be an expert. And uh, sometimes you like a country. I went to Mongolia for four days, so you can be a real expert there. But I think ultimately, ultimately it's better. It's better than being the alternative. Um, I had a, a, a student, uh, a fellow graduate student in America. He won a prize for um, having the best dissertation on Indian fertility. And I said to him, well, you must go to India a lot to get a feel for poverty in India and fertility. And he said, oh, no, no, I've never been. I've never left the United States. I don't have a passport. I just get the data from the World Bank. And I thought, well, geez, you think you'd at least be curious. So it's better to be an airport economist and to try and engage a little bit with another country's culture than, uh, uh, than, than the alternative. But anyway, he won the prize, so that was good. Now, um, um, look, I feel like an airport economist. I thought it was a good name for a book. Um, I won't plug my book because you shouldn't do that at an important conference like this. Um, but I thought it was, uh, it's available on Amazon.com, by the way, but I thought, I thought it would be a good way, it would be a good way to think about how different economies engage. So we'll be airport economists this morning, uh, seasonally adjusted. So when you begin your journeys, I always begin in, in Southeast Asia. And you've noticed now in the neighbourhood, in our region, that traditionally we only, even small businesses used to only trade with countries that spoke English uh, and never looked towards Asia. Now we see small businesses going to Singapore and Malaysia and Indonesia and to China much more than they go to Europe. That's really changed in the last um, 30 years. Um, I've benefited from this myself. Um, when I started uni uh, in Adelaide, um, the former Prime Minister of Singapore, the grand old man, Lee Kuan Yew, sent all these guys from, who were meant to go to Oxford to do nuclear physics, he sent them all to Adelaide to do um, economics. So I got these complete geniuses from Singapore got great grades, became a chief economist, and uh, most of these guys ended up being the president of Singapore and, and various high-level um, positions. In fact, my tutor, uh, my tutor Raymond Lim, became an industry minister there, and I wrote about that in the book. I called it, his name was Raymond Lim, so I called it Everybody Loves Raymond. And that was uh, a, a, real, uh, a real, real, real help to me. I still go to Southeast Asia now. Uh, here I am with uh, Frida Lin Weedy, uh, the head of Metro TV in Jakarta. Uh, here I am with uh, Rung, Dr. Rungtip, the head of Thai Public Television. In fact, she's um, launching the, the Thai version of the Airport Economist. It was a, a funny thing. At the APEC leaders' meetings, uh, they asked the leaders what your favourite book was. And Barack Obama said a team of rivals about Abraham Lincoln's cabinet. Kevin Rudd said the Bible, uh, surprisingly. And then, uh, uh, then the Thai Prime Minister said the Airport Economist. And I thought, oh, geez, he's got to be joking. So my boss told me this from, uh, from the APEC meeting, and we quickly got it translated into to Thai, and we put a bit of yellow on the cover, a bit of red, in case there was a coup or an election. Uh, and, um, and it became a bestseller in Thailand. Later I found out that I think he meant The undercover, undercover Economist by Tim Harford, but hey, it's a bestseller in Thailand now, so we won't worry about that. So, so, so Southeast Asia is very important. Um, Northeast Asia matters too. Japan, uh, South Korea, uh, Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong and China have been very, very important to us. Um, I go to Seoul a lot. I get a lot of uh, help there in, uh, in, in Seoul uh, from, from, from time to time as well. Uh, increasingly, China matters. Um, we noticed during the global financial crisis how important the stimulus package was in, in China to Australia. 
Um, you don't have to get it through Congress in, in, in China, so that, uh, that matters a lot. And even with some of the slowing in the eastern part of China, I've just come back from the west where GDP is still growing at, uh, at, at 12%. So China still will have great influence on what happens here and what Australia does there. Now, I go to China a lot. I think um, 10 years ago, I'd never been to China, never been to Chinatown. And um, uh, now I notice the diversity of China. I've also noticed that language is very important. Uh, I was very lucky. Uh, I had a very good translator when I was in China. Um, <laughs> Kevin uh, from Queensland, there to help. That was at um, the um, opening ceremony of the Beijing Olympics. Kevin Roberts, the Prime Minister there, so we had a book launch there, and you probably wondered how come I had a book launch at, on the eve of the Beijing Olympics and just happened to be in Beijing when the Olympics was on? Well, there's a very famous Australian movie, as we know, called Muriel's Wedding. That was just a coincidence that the book launch was on just at the beginning of the Beijing Olympics. And um, Kevin did a good job launching the book. He's got a bit of spare time now, so he could probably uh, help me a little bit again. But I learned from economics from another Nobel Prize winner, James Tobin, with the optimal portfolio allocation theory that you don't put all your eggs in one basket. So I got Kevin to launch that book, uh, and then I got Julia to launch the next book. Uh, she became Prime Minister. I'm bringing out a new book next year. Tony Abbott may be a bit too busy. I'm not sure what he's got to do, but um, uh, Bill Shorten just rang me up and said he was available uh, to launch it uh, uh, 365 days next year. So we'll see, we'll see, we'll see how that goes. Um, from China to India, where the bolly hill are you? Because India was a very closed economy uh, even, even, even 10 years ago. We've now seen um, a confidence in Indian culture. Uh, we even made a Bollywood film at the University of, uh, of New South Wales uh, to do this. Um, when we look at Australia's links with India, um, they weren't even in the top 10 for us uh, 10 years ago, let alone 20. Now they're in... Uh, in the top four. So when we think of China and India together, uh, in terms of Australian engagement, China is a test match. India is a 2020 game because it's come on the scene very recently and very quickly. And um, speaking of 2020 games, I did happen to be in India uh, by coincidence and uh, interviewed uh, Adam Gilchrist there. And in fact, I talked about an article I did for the Sydney Morning Herald about the Gilly effect, about someone from New South Wales moving to Western Australia for work, as, as he did, and um, I, I said, you know, you're the only uh, test cricketer with an economics effect named after you, and he got very excited and decided to text Shane Warne straight away to tell him, perhaps not the best person to, to text, so that, that was that. Um, outside China, India and, and, and Southeast Asia, there's a lot of new emerging frontiers, emerging markets in Asia that have become uh, very important. Um, I go a lot to Mongolia. And uh, Sean's got a very, uh, very good learning from Mongolia, he's going to tell you about later. But um, I go a lot to Mongolia. Everything, that, every, everything in Mongolia, their culture is so ingrained with the legend of Genghis Khan, or Chinggis Khan, as he's called there. The airport, the vodka, the beer, the hotel, everything's named after him. I was told that um, Genghis Khan, Chinggis Khan, when he conquered Asia Minor, he introduced the world's first post office, and he also reduced tariffs. He, he was the father of free trade. Uh, I thought it was David Ricardo. I thought Genghis Khan was the father of lots of things, but according to Mongolia, the father of free trade. And many Mongolians were themselves immersed in Australia. Many of them have been educated here. They have a Mongolian-Australian association known as the Mozzies, and they're, they're, uh, they're pretty influential. So that's Mongolia. Um, after that, I went to Kazakhstan. Um, the only thing I knew about Kazakhstan and Kazakhstan culture was, uh, was from the Borat movie. And um, I had an unusual experience where I went with the Premier of South Australia, for whom I work, to London. We went to an Adelaide Uni alumni function. The Premier, Jay Weatherall, had met Will and Kate, the Royal Royals, the night before, so he's used to big crowds. We turned up at this function, there was enormous crowds, it was like the Beatles, and I said, gee, that's a big crowd for the Premier of South Australia, uh, particularly in London, uh, let alone Adelaide, and I realised it wasn't for us was actually for Sasha Baron Cohen, who was uh, doing the premiere of his movie, The Dictator, at the same venue. And I said to him in character, uh, Your Excellency, Admiral General, I'm going to Kazakhstan next week. And he said, say hello to my friend Borat. He's a journalist there. And the next week I did go to Kazakhstan, and the only speaker at the conference who didn't have a Nobel Prize apart from me 
was Tony Blair. And we were speaking together and uh, I told him the story and he said, you have a pretty funny life, don't you? Because you go all the way to London to meet Borat and then you come all the way to Kazakhstan to meet Tony Blair. And uh, he, probably, he, he probably had a point. So that, that's Asia. Um, another part of the world that's emerging now is Africa. And I've written a piece, Free Trade, Nelson Mandela. Um, as you know, Nelson Mandela, who uh, is now 95 or so, when he was let out of prison and came to Australia, he came all around Australia to thank the Australian government and the ACTU for supporting his struggle against apartheid. Uh, he um, apparently, the first thing he said when he got out of prison was, has Collingwood won the grand final yet? Uh, he was there a long time. But um, he said to me when I went over to work for him, don't forget Africa, don't forget uh, South Africa. And um, what's happened is that Australian businesses now are more engaged in Africa than we thought, particularly in South Africa. I went over to work there. I was very nervous when I turned up. Uh, they said, would you like a coffee? Uh, and I didn't want to say black or white. I said, uh, with, yes, with, with milk, thanks. And they said, it's okay, it's not a test. Uh, and, 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 and we thought there'd be more capital flight. But we've actually found that South Africa's become a hub. So has Ghana, so has Kenya. So there's been more action in Africa than we thought. And Mandela said, don't forget Africa, so I haven't. I go there quite a lot. Um, there I am with uh, Miss Tansy Coetzee, uh, Miss South Africa, the first non-white winner. We're talking about um, foreign direct investment in a post apartheid South Africa there. And also there was an important economic seminar in about 2010 in South Africa again. Uh, by coincidence, um, I was asked to speak there in South Africa. Now, th there is some bad news too in the world. A um, bit of eurosclerosis, a bit of europhobia looking from Sir Eurovision, um, there's um, many difficulties with demographics in Europe as well as culture. Um, some of you may know that economics is now becoming part of popular culture. And you may have seen the film Margin Call uh, about the collapse of Lehman Brothers. They're making another movie now uh, about the crisis. It's going to be called um, My Big Fat Greek Debt, uh, coming to cinemas near, near you. So that will be something to watch, uh, particularly uh, given the impacts in Europe. Um, across the Atlantic, again, the subprime's been difficult. And the thing about the US now is that they used to say the United States had a very low unemployment rate, a very low minimum wage, but people had labour mobility. Now, um, I'm on the um, Fair Work Commission minimum wage review now. And what we've noticed is that Australia has a solid minimum wage, a living wage that people can, uh, can, can live on. We adjust it each year and Australia has a much lower unemployment rate than the US. So it just tells you that the institutions we've built in Australia and our own culture in the labour market is actually delivering very well and it's actually the US now that is struggling. It's losing a lot of its labour mobility that it used to be very famous for. And in fact, um, when Australians look to uh, America now, we look south uh, as much as we look north. As mentioned, um, I've just come back from Argentina and Mexico and Colombia. I also do a lot of work in uh, Brazil now. Um, we noticed um, at the time of the global financial crisis that China benefited Brazil as well as Australia. In fact, we wanted the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, to say, what about the bamboo shoots, not just the green shoots? And uh, we've noticed now that Brazil and Australia are playing a very, very important role uh, in driving a lot of the supply in China and the rest of Asia. Um, I've just come back from a, a book launch in Brazil. We launched a book with the Lowe Institute called Great Southern Lands about Brazil and Australia. I know it's just before the Olympics and the World Cup, just a coincidence that we wrote the book. But I think the key message of the book is that um, uh, Australia and Brazil ties will be get stronger and some of us will be at the forefront of that for our country uh, in terms of our diplomatic efforts uh, from, from here on. So you've all become airport economists now. You've all seen the world very, very quickly. And as well as economic engagement, cultural engagement has made a big difference. When you think about how Australia has fared as a very successful economy, uh, without a recession, with very strong growth in employment, very strong economic fundamentals, an ability to create almost a million jobs since, uh, uh, since the fall of Lehman Brothers, it's meant uh, a few lessons for us to think about. Now, some people think it's just luck. Um, we have resources. 
Um, we can be a can you know, we can be the, the lucky kangaroo with the dragon and the elephant, China and India, in our pouch, and that just sorts out a whole reason why Australia's got a higher standard of living. Well, it's a bit more complicated than this simple story that uh, uh, commentators uh, who should know better often, often parrot. Um, when you look at the work by MIT and, and Harvard on why nations fail, they look very, very closely at the importance of institutions and culture in economies. Uh, they compare uh, a country like uh, Botswana with the Congo, countries that can start off with a lot of resources, they can start off with lots of rocks and crops, but if they don't have good democratic institutions, they don't have good legal and parliamentary institutions, and they don't have property rights as well as democratic rights and a very strong institutional culture, then they don't succeed. And uh, my supervisor at um, Adelaide University, Ian McLean, has written a companion piece to Why Nations Fail, which is uh, why Australia prospered. Why did Australia get it right when so many other countries with the same starting point didn't? And um, I, I wrote about this in a piece I called uh, Don't Buy From Me, Argentina, about the economic history of Argentina and Australia. If you think about it, 100 years ago, Argentina was richer than Australia, and yet 100 years later, with very similar resources, land, minerals, uh, immigration, we've managed to get our institutions right and we've been able to develop a trusting culture within our society, within our economy, and Argentina hasn't. And I think that explains a lot to why you get prosperity in some nations uh, and failure in others, just in the same way as Sean will tell you and our case speakers will tell you later that organisations that get their culture wrong, despite the same endowments, uh, can also fail where organisations that have a good culture will, will, will prosper. Now, we've been able to put this to the test in Australia as we've changed our external circumstances. We talk a lot about the Asian century now. Well, uh, we really began our foray into Asia in 1957 when Blackjack McEwen, the head of the uh, country party, the deputy prime minister, signed an agreement with Japan in 1957, just 12 years after the end of World War II. And that allowed Australia to get a foothold into Asia, and it came at a time of great institutional resistance to doing so. Similarly, uh, when you look at Japan, its demand for Australian resources as it industrialised drove our growth. As Japan became richer, uh, it tapered off a bit, but it still manages to create that foothold. Similarly, uh, when Gough Whitlam went to China, that was, again, a bold step to make that foray into China. He was criticised at the time uh, in 1971, but then Kissinger and Nixon went as well, and that made it quite legitimate. And that meant, basically, that we could engage with China and the rest of the, the, the region. Uh, we had other issues in the 70s, as I mentioned at the beginning. We had a bad institutional culture in Australia. We had uh, uh, stagflation. Uh, we had industrial disputes through uh, consensus uh, under, under Bob Hawke uh, and, and the ACTU and by opening up with the Ghana report, going through recession, going through structural change, we're now in a situation where we've been able to open up to Asia strongly and proudly and engage very effectively. And when you look at that export boomerang curve I showed you before, where Japan drove our growth in the 60s and 70s, you can see now the ASEAN economies at the bend in the boomerang, and now China and India playing a very, very similar role for us. So that cultural change we made in Australia has allowed us to economically prosper as Asia has become more important. So the Asian century is upon us. What will happen in the future as some of our economic forces change? How will we institutionally adapt? Well, a lot of people say it's the end of the, the, the mining boom. That will create problems. I think uh, in some ways there will be a shift internally with how we engage with Asia. Um, there's great urbanisation in China, in India, uh, in Indonesia and so on. I've just come back from Chengdu. Now Chengdu is a western China city. People say it's just a small country town. It's got 14 million people. It'll have uh, 20 million people by 2030. 238 of its uh, Fortune 5, global Fortune 500 companies are there. So we're seeing Australian architects uh, building uh, the airports, the civic buildings, uh, allowing people to move from the countryside 
to the city. And that's made an enormous change uh, on how Australia engages uh, with China. I met a, a landscape gardener from Brisbane there. He said that everyone who had an Italian Renaissance garden, landscape garden in Brisbane has got one, if you want one, while in China, in Chengdu, as its middle class grows, that's where his business is. So he's actually moved there. So I think that as the mining boom tapers off, some of those, those institutions will come into the fore. Similarly with agriculture, uh, you can read the spectacular growth rates in the paper about uh, China uh, and so on, but it's still very, very poor and there's still a long way to go in terms of people moving to the cities and in terms of giving China and India a, a capacity to be able to, to feed its people. A lot of people are concerned that the terms of trade are coming off in Australia now as the commodity boom slows. A lot of people are concerned about the high exchange rate and Australia being an expensive place to do business. Well, as um, Sean will tell you, the most important thing that means if you don't have high commodity prices and if you have a high exchange rate is you have to do things to improve productivity and competitiveness. And this really matters because as important as mining is, when you look at where growth is in the labour market in Australia, it's in healthcare, it's in education, it's in the professions, it's in services to mining, services to construction. So the types of things that Human Synergistics does in terms of proving productivity in the services sector will matter at home, it will also matter in terms of how competitive we will be in China and India and Asia, particularly as we uh, have a high exchange rate. So that's very, very important. Sean will also tell you that um, people, when they talk about the market for commodities, uh, when they talk about deregulation of the financial market, it's not the same thing when you apply it to the labour market. Uh, Robert Solo, the famous Nobel Prize winner in economics, always says the labour market is a social institution. The market for labour is not the market for dead fish. If you drop the price of fish, the fish can't do much about it. If you drop the price of workers, they'll be pretty upset. So how you manage culture in an organisation is basically the bottom line in terms of how you build productivity. It's not about uh, individual contracts, it's not about lowering wages. It's basically about the cultural things that, uh, that, that Sean will talk about today along with our other speakers. And we know in Australia we've had very unique labour market institutions. We've been able to adapt those over time and we've been able to do very effectively to allow our economy to be open, to allow entrepreneurship to thrive, but also allow a fair go so that most Australians get the benefits of it. And that's a very, very important message when we think about organisation, organisational culture as well as national uh, culture and the links between competitiveness and, and productivity. Now, finally, just to look to the future, there's a few risks on the outlook that will matter and how we adjust. Uh, one is climate change. Uh, unfortunately, our political culture in Australia became very divisive on this issue. I think about climate change as taking a bit of, a bit of insurance and also as an international development project. Um, when you go to China, you see how polluted it is there. You, you go to India and Indonesia, if Australia can do what it does very well in terms of providing green architecture uh, in China and in India and in Indonesia, that will be a great contribution that we'll be able to make and that in turn will be important as we uh, adapt to a changing climate. And secondly, um, demography will matter in the region in the future and for us. When you look at our, our, our key trading partners, Japan is ageing, Japan doesn't have much immigration it's got a very feminine workforce, so Japan's running out of husbands. Uh, China, one-child policy, China is running out of wives. Now, I don't think we can have a Japan-China free trade agreement on that issue, but that really shows a, an issue that will matter with China, while uh, India, Indonesia, Vietnam have very, very young populations. In India, 50% of people are under 25, so that will actually change the, the nature of the demographic with Australia. In Australia, we are ageing too, but we have the benefit of immigration. Uh, one in four Aussies is born overseas, two thirds of our entrepreneurs, and one in two of our exporters are born overseas. So Australia, by being open to immigration, has changed its culture and ultimately allowed itself to prosper economically. And you think about some of the great names in Australia, uh, great corporate names, Westfield, uh, Bing Lee, Meyer, all started by people that came here with no English and no capital, and we're able to build extraordinary organisations for all of us uh, to be employed, so, so quite a story. Immigration has uh, changed my own family too. 
Uh, my wife's American of Albanian and Sicilian and Mongolian descent. Uh, my daughter's from China. So we have one big happy free trade agreement uh, in, uh, in, in, in our family. Uh, and this was taken at Bondi Beach, uh, where I mentioned I had a uh, Transylvanian lifesaver for a grandpa. Well, um, I think that's a very important message because if you have a country uh, where a Transylvanian um, rabbi lifesaver can come and make it his home, and you have a country where um, a little girl from China can come here and make it her home, then I think that says that Australia has a lot of very important reasons to be optimistic about a future. We changed our culture by being open to trade and investment, uh, but also to people and ideas. And that's the reason why Australia has gone from a very protected isolationist country to a very open, uh, opening, open, proud and, and, and confident country. And I think the same thing happens in lessons of institutions. If you're open to people and open to ideas and open for business, then you too will improve your culture and ultimately improve your economic prosperity, just as Australia has in our own economic reform story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.